I want to begin with a question, an important question. What do you do inside when your faith in Jesus begins to wane? When your passion for following God gets weak, what do you do inside? What do do you do? I think this is a very important question because as I've been a follower of Jesus for almost 50 years, it's like I have ups and downs in following. I have real passionate times and then I have less passionate times. And what do you do when you're in a less passionate time? What does the Bible say you ought to do in a less passionate time? And I was thinking, what about the groups of people in this room? What, what, what do you do? And I was thinking some of you uh, real simply like try to use your willpower, right? You uh, pull up your bootstraps, you try harder, you bring your willpower to it. But one of the great things I've learned lately in the last 10 years is willpower is a limited commodity. Anyone who's tried to diet and been up too late at night realizes you it's very easy late at night to run out of willpower and begin to snack again because willpower is a limited commodity. So as you're trying to bring your oomph, your own oomph to following Jesus, it, it, you can run short. And a, another thing I think probably some of you do is you emotionally and spiritually beat yourselves up. It's like, I'm a loser. I've always been a loser. What happened to my passion? You just beat yourselves up. That doesn't work very well, does it? And some of you have like specific spiritual strategies like get out your Bible and start reading again or get on your knees and start praying again. Those are good strategies. But I want to bring a one-word answer that you found both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that when your passion's waning, God has a one-word answer in his scriptures. Ed taught it last week in a different emphasis. The word is remember. The Bible says over and over and over and over again, what do you do when you lose your passion? You remember. What do you remember? You remember who God is, and what he's done for you in your life. Remember in the Old Testament, God would give the armies a victory, and what would he say? He'd say, hey, build a big pile of rocks here, and every time you walk by this pile of rocks, remember. And not only you, but tell your children why this pile of rocks is here, right? Remember. And then Jesus is in the upper room. We're going to do communion a little bit. He looks at his guys, and he knows their passions are going to be like this. He goes, hey, I got something for you to do. Remember the bread. Remember the cup. And so uh, I want to challenge you on this week when everything is like go forward, right? School starts, you and I starts, football starts. Everything is forward that if your passion begins to wane some point here, you need to call a a pause, time out, and you need to remember. And what do you remember? You kind of remember your roots. You kind of remember where you've met God and what he's done for you. So I, I was remembering when I was in camp, and I was, uh, I was actually a kid in this church, and I went to a camp, and uh, the counselor sat one night uh, on a camp cot in our cabin, six, eight guys, and he goes, uh, do you guys know what the gospel of Jesus is? And he said, I have a three-word answer for what the gospel is, and three S words, and we have a slide, sin, salvation, service. And he said, if you can get your head around these three terms, then you can give your heart to Jesus, and you can, if you can get your head around sin, and then what he did to save you, salvation, and then what you're going to do with your life, which is serve him, if you can get your head around these, you're in good shape. And so what I need to do is, and I didn't do it then. Uh, some camps were too forceful for me, too manipulative in my mind. And so they gave us all a stick, and they said, if you want to give your heart to Jesus, you know, throw the stick into the fire. Literally, there was too much emotion. There was too much manipulation. I literally took my stick. Instead of throwing it in the fire, I threw it in a cornfield. But then two weeks later, in my bunk bed, at home in the dark, I remembered sin, salvation, service, and I prayed my first real prayer. And it was a real prayer of faith. God, if you're real, help me know it. Now, there's a prayer of faith. If you're even real, God, help me know it. But it's okay. God hears all kinds of prayers, right? God, if you're real, help me know it. And over the course of days and months, years, he's helped me know it. So now, 
as I try to communicate sin salvation service over the years, I've developed like some stories, and that's a part of this classics. Tim Walston said backstage a little while ago, what I've done in this teaching, which he heard before, was uh, I took his three favorite youth ministry stories from 30 years ago and put them all in one teaching. Uh, so here's the first one. Frank was an interior lineman on our football team, and in those days, I was in youth ministry, and in those days, every summer, we went to amusement parks two, three, or four times, sometimes five. I've been to almost all the amusement parks. I've been on there over and over and over again. I've been on roller coasters. I've been to the roller coaster capital of the United States, Sandusky, Ohio, over and over and over again. So uh, we were in line, Frank and I. Well, first of all, I recruited him. He really wasn't a part of our youth ministry. I recruited him because he was a football lineman, good guy, brought a friend. Um, we stayed in gyms. We slept on the floor. Late at night, that first night on the floor, about 1030, we've been playing basketball. Frank goes, coach, Mr. Bartlett, I'm hungry. <laughs> well, there was like a quick trip kind of place across, so I smuggled him and his friend out. We went across two big nacho chips with cheese, you know, a big Diet Coke. Now he's like on his sleeping bag next to me. It's like having a giant rat over there nibbling, <laughs> making weird noises, and I'm trying to sleep, right? So we get up the next morning, we clean up the gym, we drive across Chicago, which is where we were. We stop at a McDonald's, two big breakfasts, if you remember those, for Frank. I said he was an interior lineman, a big guy. We head over, we go to uh, what was the fastest, tallest wooden roller coaster. We're in line and it's really long, really long. And so Frank looks at me, we're going to go together, it's going to be so fun. And he says, no lie, he says, Coach, I'm hungry. You just had two big breakfasts. Couldn't help it, he was hungry. Literally true. This is totally true. The food that's in that line when you're waiting, the food truck right there, chili dogs. It's like 9 o'clock in the morning, two chili dogs. He's snarfing these down. We wait in a long line. He's got to be in the front car of this world's highest, fastest wooden roller coaster. So I sit behind him. We're going up. I haven't even got to the store yet. We're going up, and we hit that spot where you just go down. You know, they work on gravity and all this. And at that point, no lie, up it comes. Chili dogs. Nacho chip chunks. Egg bits. Now, when he turns his head, you tell me where it goes. Bits got inside my glasses. This is no lie. I tasted it. Now, I'm riding the world's fastest wooden roller coaster with barf all over my body. And you know, you have to hang on to those things. And then, now think about this. Literally, my hair is caked down. I've got chunks all over my face. And you pull into the station, and everybody waiting in line is like looking at you. Frank looks okay. I look terrible. Hi. I got off. I tried to get cleaned up. I couldn't get the smell completely off of me the whole day. And I gave a talk that night to a couple hundred kids we'd taken in buses. And all day long, I kept thinking about this barf. And like, how does it fit the talk? And just when I was getting ready, it dawned on me. That's you and me and our sin with Almighty God. We don't teach sin maybe as much as we should. On your best day, on your best day, you barf on God. He has a plan. I've never once lived a day the way he wanted me to. Never once. I always have a little sin. I always have a wrong motive. I always have something. And that is so, so 
gross to God. It's like I walk up to give him my best gift and he unwraps it and there it is, egg chunks, chips. The Bible says our best work is like filthy rags. Therefore, he sent Jesus to clean up our sin. What a beautiful, beautiful story. And on a day when your passion is waning, what if you could just picture yourself covered with barf and Jesus takes you to a car wash and he just cleans you up? What a beautiful story to tell ourselves when our passion, I, it doesn't work for me to beat myself up anymore. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for me to try to, you know, create more willpower. It doesn't work. But it does work to remember what God has done in my life. And I look back, and I don't only have good days when I sin. I have bad days when I'm off, right? My favorite story in the Bible of Jesus about this is uh, in John chapter 8. I'm going to read it to you. I want you to be at church 2,000 years ago because that's where the story takes place. So Jesus is at church 2,000 years ago. You're sitting here, and it says this. At dawn, this is John 8, Jesus appeared in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and sat down, and he sat down to teach them. So here I am sitting down to teach you. I'm Jesus. You're the people. You've come for a lot of reasons. You've heard I do miracles sometimes. You've heard I'm a rabbi. You've heard I have some followers. You heard the church officials don't even like me. So you're here, and the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, the teachers in the law and the Pharisees, the ones with robes on, the ones who are like uh, supposed to know what's going on, they, what do they do? They drag in a woman caught in adultery. And they made her stand before the group, so she's standing right here, probably wrapped in a blanket, because she's caught in the act of adultery, caught in the act of adultery. And they made her stand before the group, and they said to Jesus, so they're talking to me, Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery in the law of Moses, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? The Bible has this paraphrase piece here. They were using this question as a trap in order for, to have a basis for accusing Jesus. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Now, nobody knows what he wrote. I've heard lots of ideas. Some people thought he wrote the names of women that the church officials had been with secretly. Some people thought maybe just wrote a list of sins that they owned. Nobody knows what he wrote. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, I love this line. If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Go ahead. The Living Bible says, go ahead, rock her to death. But the only person who can throw the first one is the person without sin. Actually, there was only one person in the room who could have picked up the stone and thrown it, right? Jesus. He could have picked up the stone and said, I'm without sin. Let's go. Now, you're in the audience. What are you feeling at this moment? Some of you in the back are going, whoa, I got to find a big rock. This is going to be fun. Some of you, maybe especially women, are feeling sad for her. Some of you analytical people are going, where's the man? I'm not a genius, but you don't commit adultery by yourself. Lots of questions. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, and I love this phrase, the older ones first. They had a little wisdom. They knew they were beat. They started to fade off. Jesus straightened up until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Now, that's an interesting way to end a church service. <laughs> He's teaching all these people. They bring in the woman. Now, every, everybody's gone. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said.
neither do I condemn you. Those might be the most powerful words in the whole Bible. Jesus had the right and the privilege to pick up a stone and punish her. She had sinned. There wasn't any debate about that. And what does he say? Neither do I condemn you. We're raising our children. That's a message we desperately need our children to hear. Because of repentance, Jesus looked at her face and he knew she was sorry. Now, here's the key question. The Bible doesn't even ask it. She leaves. What does she do? Does she climb in the back seat of another chariot? Does she go on committing adultery? Because what? She got off scot-free. She's free. The master didn't even condemn her. He did say go and sin no more. I was actually doing this talk in New York City at a university, and one of the band members who, during my talk, was sitting in the front row, started waving her hand. And you know, it was a big gathering, but I just thought, well, Dave, go for it. Yes, what can I do for you? She said, I know what the woman did. Well, I was interested. What what, what did the woman do? How do you know? She said, I was a prostitute on the streets of New York, and I met Jesus, and it totally changed me. She said, I think that's what happened. She was in the worship band at a college event. The awesome power of total forgiveness. The awesome power of total forgiveness. So I I realized that this story... uh, wasn't as strong for maybe men, especially high school, college men, as uh, maybe it was for uh, some others uh, with more wisdom who left early. Uh, So uh, I created this one. Let's pretend for a minute you're a high school boy. In fact, you're a senior in high school, and it's Friday night, and your dad comes home with a brand new red convertible. Brand new. Did I say that? It's the first new car he's ever bought. He parks it in the driveway. He comes in, and he shows your mom. Remember, you're a senior boy in high school. Some of you remember being a senior boy in high school. Those were good days. Your dad takes your mom for a ride, and they come back, and she slid over by him in the sports car, and you're going, oh, gross, 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 gross. But then you're sitting at table, and you get this senior in high school idea. Dad, could I take your brand-new car to the game tonight? And your dad remembers what it would be like to be a senior in high school and drive a brand-new red sports convertible to the game. And so... He says, yes, son, yes. I don't, I don't have the insurance 100% squared away, so just drive it to the game, show off a little, drive home. You go, okay, I got it. But when you're at the game, after parking directly in front of the school, because you went early, you park the car right in front of the school, you went into the gym, you're sitting there, and there's this girl. Trouble always starts with those words. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Remember, this is a youth ministry talk, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Trouble. <laughs> she sits be- I'm not going there anymore. She sits beside him. He didn't even know she knew he existed. And she leans over against his shoulder and says, could I have a ride afterwards? Of course his brain melts. Of course his heart throbs. And he goes, yes, anywhere you want to go. And it's not just her, but it's her and two friends. And it's not just a short ride, it's across town to the Pizza Hut, and they're having a riot, and when they come out, there's been a sleet storm. He takes her home, and he's on his way to his home, and he totals his dad's car against a building. The police come. He begs them to throw him into jail. (laughs) Please, sir, I cannot go home and face my dad. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot. And the police say it doesn't work that way, so then they bring him home. He's walking in. He's looking for something to protect himself with. And his dad turns around, and he says this, Son, a car I can replace. I'm just so glad you're okay. We'll work it out in the morning. 
go ahead, go to bed. And if you were a high school or a college audience right now, somebody would yell out, who's got a dad like that? <laughs> and the truth would be, you do. He's in heaven. He looks down every single day. You wrecked yesterday by what you said and did and didn't do. The Bible's real clear on that. You wrecked yesterday. And this morning, God reached into his pocket and he pulled out a brand new set of keys. And he said, go ahead, take a new day and live it for me. Because that's what happens in my story. It's a week later. And the boy's sitting at supper. His dad has replaced the car. And the boy just wants to just keep his head down and be at supper. And his dad reaches into his pocket, pulls out the key and says, I want you to drive my car to the game tonight. How would you drive his car? I had some guys say, I would only shine it. I wouldn't drive it. I would just shine it up. Or I would drive it so carefully. Why the change? You see, there's an awesome power in total forgiveness. An awesome power in total forgiveness. When we understand, when we remember the slate is clean, God loves us just like he loved his son Jesus. When we remember that, it motivates us. It motivates us. The scriptures are clear. Let me remind you, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is what? Death. Death eternal. Romans 5, 8. There's a free gift of God in Christ Jesus. God demonstrated his own love for us in this. Christ died for us. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. Sin, salvation, service. What is it you need to remember? What is it you need to remember when your passion gets weak? And how can you do it? I told Jeff in the office before, I said, in some ways, this is the wrong teaching for this day. Um, because today is a day when everybody's focus is forward. It's like school starting, football, you and I. I mean, all this is going forward. And I'm saying, take a pause and remember which fits. It's good. We're going to do it in a minute. But as I thought about that, I thought about, uh, I've got lots of roller coaster stories because I've been on hundreds of them. And I was thinking of the day that might fit your day better, Magnum XL 200, Sandusky, Ohio. It was the fastest, this is 20 years ago, it was 30 years ago. It was the fastest, highest roller coaster in the world. It's still there, but now, of course, every other year, they build a bigger, faster, higher one. And you can go, and it's a mediocre one now, but on 30 years ago, 25 years ago, it was like the world's fastest, highest. I waited in line for an hour and a half with kids. It was the first roller coaster invented that I know of that had both a seat belt and a harness, both. You got in these cars, this train, and then I actually went online and listened to the engineer. He said, I take people up real slow. I want them to think. Do you realize I'm in that car and I'm with some kids and like I'm going up real and I'm having a love-hate relationship with roller coasters? On the one hand, I'm trying to say I love this, I love this, I love this. On the other hand, I hate this, I hate this, I'm going to die. He says the way he made it was so that once you hear the yell, you're standing in line for an hour and a half, once you hear the yell, you never see those people again. What happened to him? Don't know. So I'm on this thing, and I'm going over, and it's also the first roller coaster where they snap a picture to you, of you at the most exciting part, and then you can go see it on screens and buy those. So when it came to my picture, because I thought it was just like up, 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 die, it was not that easy at all. <laughs> up, 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 die, and then... My picture, I 
had a teenage girl beside me. She's like this. I'm like. We got into the station. And you know how they stop you real fast. And it's like, everybody clapped. We lived. We lived. We got out. You know what the kid said. The kid said, hey, let's go again. Yes, of course. Let's wait in line another hour and a half and have that experience. I said no. I sat on a bench. And I thought. And here's what I thought. If I were going to design a roller coaster, just like that, you know, how would I design it? I had some great ideas. One, it wouldn't be a train of cars. It would just be an individual car for two people. And the biggest feature of mine would be a handbrake. <laughs> so that you can, like, pull it and slow the thing down whenever you want. So I would get to the top of my hill, which would be the same hill, and I would pull it and I'd look over, beautiful day. <laughs> Cars, rides, it's so fun up here, I love this. Then I would let it go down real slow. Now those of you who are into physics would realize there would be a problem with this, <laughs> but forget that part. And I would just take it real slow and careful. There would actually be only one problem with my roller coaster. When we got to the station, there would be nothing to cheer about. Because the thrill that the track was invented to give us, we never got because I rode the handbrake. Now hear me on this. This fall, you each have a handbrake in your life. You can not, like, not go for it with Jesus, not go for it in school. You can, like, take the comfortable road, or there's chances where you can keep your hand off the handbrake and just plunge into life. And when you get done, then there will be something to cheer about because Jesus will see you one day and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You kept your hand off the brake. Fall of 2018, you didn't touch the handbrake. You just let me lead and guide you. And you remembered, and you kept your passion hot. Hmm. I'm going to pray. I actually b brought a prayer from uh, King David in the book of Psalms, so I'm going to read this prayer as we pray together. Let's pray. Psalm 51. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your mercy, blot out our transgressions. For we know our transgressions and our sin is ever before us. It's on our mind. Against you, you only have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Purge us, Father, and we shall be clean. Wash us and we shall be whiter than snow. Let us hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Create in us a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit before us. Amen.